1500 Central European summertime, although it's just a little bit of summer outside, cold temperatures, uh, but at least we have some sunshine here in Munich. So I welcome everybody to today's um, Ravenna webinar, which is uh, called the deeper dive into AS67 and SMT SD2110 or the audio files. That's because we want to concentrate today on the audio parts of both standards. All right, so uh, let's move on. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Andreas Hildebrand. I'm working for ALC Networks out of Munich. And ALC Networks is the company who um, yeah, invented, developed, uh, and marketed the uh, Ravenna technology, which has been introduced 10 years ago. So this uh, year is our 10th uh, anniversary. Let's have a, a quick look first into AS67. And for those on the call last week, um, there will be a few slides of repetition as an introduction to AS67, but we will then directly go straight into the details, um, uh, which is then also important for the 2110 audio uh, fundamentals. So AS67 is a high performance streaming audio over IP interoperability standard initially published in 2000. 13, uh, and it has uh, received two revisions, the latest in 2018. However, nothing has significantly changed, so everything is still standing fundamentally as with the initial um, um, version in 2013. All right, the scope of AES67 uh, was focused on professional audio, low latency audio, over typical production networks, which includes campus um, networks, uh, broadcast uh, networks. And the design goal was to use existing protocols and mechanics wherever possible. AS67 deliberately excludes anything which is not IP networking. So any networking on the lower layer is not part of AS67. Any uh, data compression or low bandwidth media, which we don't consider um, low latency um, uh, uh, at this time. And anything uh, in terms of network, which is low performance or the public internet cannot serve for AES67 transmission. And since it's an AES, Audio Engineering Society standard, video is also not part of the standard, but you will see later on that uh, basically every protocol and fundamental principles which have been defined for AES67 also serve for SMT SD2110. So let me emphasize again, the scope is on interoperability guidelines using existing protocols wherever possible, because the goal with AS67 was that all the already existing technology providers uh, should be should have been encouraged, encouraged to actually adopt AS67 either as a special mode or as a their native mode of operation. So here's our, a quick illustration uh, what the problem is. We have all these uh, existing technologies before AS67 uh, was uh, defined. They are all based on IP, but uh, even though they are based on IP, they just can't talk to each other directly. You always had to go through analog or digital connections. So. Uh, not quite true for LiveWire and Ravenna. Uh, we set up a scheme for interoperability already back in 2012, so a year before AS67 was finally published. But then AS67 came out, and by following the AS67 definitions and guidelines, uh, immediate interoperability based on IP is becoming possible or was becoming possible. So here's uh, another illustration for a typical interoperability situation or problem uh, which AS67 can easily solve. Let's assume we have um, a venue um, and another venue close by. They are both running different network technologies. And then they are, say, OBVAN pulling up. Uh, BBC OBVAN. Well, I guess they have uh, much modern OBVANs. Let's take a much modern OBVAN here. Let's assume that one's running Ravenna. So the problem now is if you want to connect directly to the venues, it just doesn't work because there is just no indirect interoperability between these three networking schemes. And that's where AS67 can help. Uh, in, the, in the very moment, AS67 is supported by these networking technologies. You can immediately interchange signals based on IP. Of course, signals need to be forwarded to a host broadcasting station. You may uh, want to use Ravenna for that, or the well-known ASIP scheme, uh, which is um, defined, which has been defined by the EBU. And uh, AS67 was carefully designed to also support uh, ASIP receivers, uh, at least. 
So AS67 is a very versatile um, protocol and standard which enables interoperability. So in order to do so, um, the standard needs to define, uh, uh, identify technology components and define some protocols, some values, some variables, some mechanisms for it. So these are the typical ingredients of any audio over IP solutions. And for each of these uh, functional blocks, AES67 came up with a mandatory requirement or protocol to be supported in order to be AES67 compliant. Typical audio over IP um, systems also support something like discovery so that uh, participants on the system know what is exactly on the network, but this has been deliberately excluded by AS67 because it's not uh, technically required to um, establish uh, the technical interoperability. So let's have a, a, a deeper look at the uh, particular ingredients um, for the audio uh, synchronization and transport. First of all, uh, we need synchronization and media clocking. Um, AS67 defined the PTP version 2, precision time protocol version 2, and the media clocking was defined to be uh, 48 kilohertz, but uh, there were other optional uh, media clocks uh, also defined in AS67. So how does that work? Let's have a deeper look. Um, first of all, every node, a node is a device sitting on a network, uh, is running a local clock not just a frequency, a real clock with time. And those local clocks are precisely synchronized to a common reference clock, we we'll call them wall clock, with the PTP protocol. Now, from those local clocks, every device can individually generate a media clock, basically any desired media clock. So it's not just 48 kilohertz for the whole system or 44.1, every node can generate whatever media clock it actually needs. So here's a quick illustration on that. We have our wall clock, our master clock, may or may not be referenced to GPS. We have the slave nodes um, uh, on the um, network uh, and they carry clocks inside and those clocks are precisely synchronized to the master clock utilizing the PTP protocol. Now from those clocks, from those local clocks, the devices can generate their media clocks independently. And if those clocks are just precisely enough synchronized to each other, then the generated media clocks are also uh, precise enough or identical to each other, not just with frequency, but also with their phase. So let's have a uh, closer look into the clocks which are actually running in such a system. Actually, um, the whole system comprises of three different clocks. We have the common reference clock, which is called the wall clock, provided by a grandmaster, which does not necessarily have to be a physical external device. Any node basically, uh, in the absence of a particular grandmaster, can take the role of a grandmaster. Now then there's a local copy of that wall clock inside each node through the PTP. Then we have the media clock. The media clock is derived from that local clock. Uh, it can be 48 kilohertz for audio, for video nodes, it might be 90 kilohertz or any other media clock which is required for a particular operation. And then we have a stream clock. Um, streams or transport or stream data is transported with a real-time protocol, RTP. So we have the RTP clock, which in case of AES67 is derived from the media clock. So now this looks a bit abstract, so here's an illustration um, uh, to further clarify the situation. We have a sender, a receiver, a grandmaster clock. We have local clocks inside the devices which are synchronized through PTP. So the local clocks basically carry the same time as the grandmaster clock. Now those local clocks have media clock circuitry which produce media clocks, but they have to follow the local clock or they are derived from the local clock. And of course, that's the same on the receiver side. So now we set both devices to generate the same media clock, let's say 48 kilohertz, they are exactly the same as long as they follow the... Now the third component comes into game, and that is a stream. Once I start transporting or transferring or sending out a stream from the sender to the receiver, there's the RTP stream clock. Now this RTP stream clock follows or is derived from the media clock, but it may have a random offset. Now, the um, standard committee which defined the RTP standard, which is by the way, the uh, IETF, 
and they define these weird sounding RFCs and uh, for RTP stream transfer it's the RFC 3550 which is uh, very important. They say please um, add a random offset to each individual stream and um, the uh, reason for that is they uh, were looking into encrypted streams already and because um, the clock information is part of the RTP information, the encrypted part of it, they didn't want to have a well-known value in there so they said okay um, just um, allow to add a random offset for each individual stream. However that offset of course has to remain constant throughout the stream's lifetime. Now, in order for the receiver to actually know at what time a particular stream or a particular sample in the stream had been generated or should be played out, it needs to know that uh, particular offset. And now, because the value um, is not part of the RTP data itself, it has to be conveyed over from the sender to the receiver, what we call out of band. And for that, we use the SDP information or the SDP protocol. And there's an attribute inside the SDP which tells the receiver what particular offset is being used for this particular stream. So it tells the offset, uh, it sends the offset to the receiver, but out of band. So it's not part of any um, a crypto attack uh, targeting at the stream. So this is the principal illustration how uh, these three different kinds of clocks operate in a typical AS67 environment. So next component is transport. Transport is based on the already mentioned RTP over UDP over IP with unicast and multicast. I have explained that in further detail in my previous uh, webinar. Uh, if you're interested in that, a recording and slides are available. So for now, we just look at the RTP packet because it carries a vital information. Uh, each RTP packet has a header, optional payload headers, and the payload itself. So here's the RTP header that always has 12 bytes of length. And then there's the RTP payload, which carries the actual media data. Um, the payload, uh, the payload header, uh, yeah, the RTP header, sorry, uh, has a very vital information and that is the RTP timestamp. That timestamp, in our case, in the case of linear PCM audio, which we are uh, transporting with AS67, is just a media clock counter. So it's not a real time information, it's a clock counter, uh, which just counts the clock cycles which have been passed or in other words indicates the clock cycle of the first sample in the payload area. Now this media clock counter field is 32-bit um, uh, wide and uh, you can imagine that uh, at a clock rate of 48,000 hertz, 48 kilohertz, 48,000 clock cycles per second, that this uh, field will have a rollover and actually the rollover happens roughly once per day at 48 kilohertz. So in other words, it rolls over and starts at zero again. Um, well, as long as we are talking about real-time streams and not anything archived which can be played out at a, at a later time, we don't have a problem because no stream whatever uh, need more than one day to, um, uh, to, to start from the sender and then just uh, reach the receiver. Um, I've just made a calculation uh, somewhere and it says that uh, a stream needs to be transported three times back and forth to Neptune in order to be uh, on its way for 24 hours actually at the speed of light. So in our situation this does not pose a problem but for the calculations we have to take this rollover into consideration of course. So that's uh, where the uh, time information of a particular um, payload is being transported. Now, what goes into the payload of an RTP packet? So we have to look at the encoding block. Uh, for encoding, uh, AS67 calls for some mandatory encoding parameters to be supported. First of all, sampling rate. 40 kilohertz, uh, 48 kilohertz sampling rate is the mandatory sampling rate to be supported, but uh, for other applications uh, which require different sampling rates, AES67 also has uh, recommendations for 44.1 and for um, uh, 2FX sample rates. So you can see sample rate is the conversion from the analog signal into a digital signals with digital samples. Then another parameter is the bit width uh, of the uh, PCM encoded audio. So AS67 says that 16 and 24 bits are to be supported. 
well, and we look at the uh, resolution uh, over time, we have uh, 16 bits on here, and you can see there's uh, on, the, um, on the vertical axis, uh, a higher resolution that's 24 bit, and this uh, diagram also features a higher uh, time resolution compared to the uh, diagram on the left. That could be the situation with, uh, let's say, 48 and uh, 96 kilohertz. So, but you can see the higher the bit width and the higher the resolution, the more granular the um, PCM encoded data uh, will get. So, then um, it says, uh, that the number of channels which can be transported per stream can be anything between one through eight. So let's have a look at the uh, PCM samples here. We have, uh, in case of a stereo signal, we have a left sample and a right sample in 16 or 24 bits. Uh, and of course, um, these samples are just uh, next to each other, uh, subsequent samples. And if we look at a typical PCM bit stream uh, of a stereo signal, we have an interleaved a uh, lineup of left channel, right channel, left channel, right channel, first sample, second sample, third sample. So that's the, well, the those three parameters are, are required for AS67 support. And the fourth parameter for the encoding uh, description is the packet time. Now, what's the packet time? The packet time uh, defines the number of frames per packet at a given sample rate. Why is it called time? Because at a sample rate, a number of samples can be converted into time and uh, vice versa. So let's have a look at this. Let's assume we have an N channel, N could be eight or four or seven or three or whatever, or even one. Let's for now assume it's an A channel, multi-channel uh, or multi-track signal. And each of those channels apparently has consecutive samples and those are lined up over time. and a frame is now what the audio engineer is calling the samples, all the samples uh, which belong to one particular point in time to all those channels or those tracks. So frame one covers all the samples of all channels per sampling period. So we have frame one, frame two, frame three, and the lineup uh, of the sample stream is like, we have sample one of the first channel, second channel, eighth channel, then continuing on with sample two of all the channels and sample three of all the channels. Or if we look at the stream of frames, we have frame one, frame two, frame three over time. So frame basically is the uh, other channels, uh, other, other samples of all channels at a particular sampling time. So packet time indicates the number of frames per packet at a given sample rate. Uh, quick calculation here, packet time of one millisecond is what AS67 calls for, and that is exactly 48 frames uh, at 48 kilohertz. So here's the uh, number, here's the packet times which are supported by AS67, and only one of those packet times is really uh, required or mandatory, it's the one millisecond packet time. Uh, but we have recommendations if shorter packet times are required, which one to choose from. Interestingly enough, there's also the four millisecond packet time, um, which can carry a typical uh, stereo um, stream as being defined at 16 bit as being defined by the ASIP standard. You may uh, recall that earlier I mentioned that AS67 can also support ASIP receiver. So you just have to use the four millisecond packet time with the stereo L16, so 16 bit PCM encoding, and then you're perfectly uh, compatible with an ASIP receiver. Um, I have prepared um, a, a quick Wireshark um, capture here, but uh, I guess for now we jump over it uh, because that might go uh, too deep into the, uh, into the uh, matter. Um, some encoding examples. Um, remember uh, from my last presentation, the maximum transfer unit of Ethernet is 1,500 bytes, which translates into a maximum payload size per RTP packet of 1,460 bytes, and the AS67 even allows only 1,440 bytes. So typically, uh, encoding setups, let's say a 16-bit stereo um, stream at one millisecond at 48 kilohertz, needs 192 bytes, uh, the same with 24 bits, 
well, it needs 288 bytes. And we could also can have a 24-bit surround um, package with two uh, with another stereo inside, so eight channels. Uh, and that is uh, covering uh, most of the allowed uh, payload size of a particular uh, RTP packets. All these encodings are encodings which had to be supported mandatory under AS67 for receivers. It doesn't mean that any sender needs to support these um, uh, uh, these uh, packetizations, for example, a microphone may only send off one channel at 24-bit 48 kilohertz, one millisecond packet time, but a receiver needs to be able to decode all of these typical AS67 setups. Uh, on the optional side, uh, there might be this four millisecond uh, packetization time, which I just mentioned, or a 96 frame, one millisecond uh, packetization at 96 kilohertz. And those are also supported um, uh, encodings under AS67, but they are optional. So a receiver does not necessarily need to support these uh, encodings. And then there are, of course, other encodings which are possible uh, in AOIP and advanced AOIP systems. For example, um, the uh, Ravenna solution also supports uh, something like MADI over IP so that 64 channels can be transported in one stream at a much higher frame rate or much lower packet time so that only seven frames or even less are uh, in one packet, RTP packet. Well, so if we have this huge choice of encoding um, options, how would a receiver know what actually is inside the RTP payload? Well, and that is where something comes into game, uh, another functional block of AS67, which is called the session description. SDP, it's another RFC standard. Let's have a quick look at the session description protocol. Uh, every sender is required to provide an SDP because without the SDP, um, the receiver wouldn't know anything about the stream formatting, the synchronization, and the connection information. Uh, it's provided by a sender for each stream, and the good thing, it's human readable. So if we look at a typical SDP, we will find for much, uh, information like the IP address of the SDP offerer, most often that's the uh, IP address of the sender device, but it doesn't have to be. We have a, a string information, which is the clear or the human readable text uh, for the stream. So that can be any, any meaningful name here. Um, we have a synchronization information. Actually, the sender tells me that this particular stream is referenced to a grandmaster clock with this particular ID. So the receiver can immediately check, oh, is that the very same reference as I'm uh, uh, synchronized to? If not, I will most likely not be able to synchronize onto the stream and you would experience pop and clicks, although 48 kilohertz may be nominally the same, but it's not coming off the same uh, uh, reference or same origin. And then we have this stream clock offset, the RTP clock offset. In this case, it's uh, zero, but it can be any other random value. Then we have the information what type the, of media, the payload uh, area of the RTP actually carries. First of all, it's audio. It could also be video, of course. Um, we have a port number over at center, and we have a payload type information. Now this payload type information needs further description. That's where the RTP map uh, parameter comes in. So if this parameter is uh, identified in the RTP packet, it means that the payload is L24, so PCM linear 24 bit at 48 kilohertz, two channels. So this is vital information. Otherwise the receiver just won't know what stream former is in that particular payload area. The next information is the multicast address. In this case, it's a multicast stream. It could be unicast stream as well, of course, but it's a multicast stream as we can see at the uh, uh, leading uh, octet of the uh, IP address, 239 is clearly indicating an administratively scoped multicast address. So that stream is a typical multicast stream which lives at that particular address. And then we have the, uh, uh, the uh, least, uh, the, the last uh, uh, important information, that's the packet time in milliseconds. So in this case, that stream carries 48 frames because it's encoded 48 kilohertz L24 stereo. So that is the good thing. Um, a quick hint uh, that there's a very valuable tool freely available on the Ravenna webpage. It's called the uh, Rough to Subconverter. Besides being able to translate the uh, advertisements uh, from a Ravenna system into a sub 
based system like the Dante system and vice versa. It also gives you the ability to display the um, SDP information, which is on offer with each individual stream. You can see that here is much more information um, inside. I don't want to go through this at this point in time. The tool is freely available on the Ravenna website and is very, very helpful in uh, not just um, uh, translating between different advertising schemes, but also into debugging um, streams or setting up uh, SDPs if they are missing. So another important thing uh, in AS67 is what we call the link offset between sender and receiver or the latency between sender and receiver. This is an illustration taken from the standard. Uh, just a very quick uh, uh, explanation. On the left side, we see a typical sender implementation. We have an analog to digital converter. Uh, we have a sender packet buffer. Well, this packet buffer is required because if we have a packet time, one millisecond, we need to gather 48 frames first before we can actually forward that particular packet to the network stack and controller. And also there's the uh, media clock generation, which comes from the uh, network clock, which is uh, synchronized from the network side through PTP. The network itself, it's an IP uh, network. And then on the receiver, we have the very, very same ingredients as on the sender side. Now, important is the ingress time reference point and the egress time reference point, because the ingress time reference point is actually that point in time which is recorded as the sampling time for a particular sample. So remember in the RTP packet, there was the media clock counter. And that's exactly at this point when we gather this sample uh, into the uh, input stage, uh, we exactly record the current media clock sample count. And that is what is being stored into the RTP timestamp um, of an RTP packet. So since there are more samples or more frames in the packet, it's always the first, it always references to the first sample in the packet. So then the next important value is the link offset. That is a chosen offset or delay between um, the uh, uh, ingress and the uh, egress uh, reference planes, um, which will tell um, the uh, latency, the duration between the ingress and the playout. Uh, point in time of a particular sample. So in order to calculate this, I need to take this the chosen link offset uh, into consideration. Now, the link offset needs to be chosen in a way that it covers the packet time, any jitter which may occur in the network stack, any jitter which may occur in the network itself, and so on uh, in the whole chain. So if we uh, choose a too small link offset, samples won't just arrive in time for the desired egress uh, yeah, reference point or egress playout at time. So link offset is basically the chosen latency for a particular stream. So that needs to be, uh, a link offset needs to be added um, to the uh, first sample. And then the RTP offset, if there is one, the random one needs to be subtracted from that value. And then we have the desired playout time for the sample at the egress reference point. That is the whole secrecy, uh, secret uh, behind uh, the link offset and the timing and the way various streams in a network are synchronized with each other. So uh, a quick um, explanation on latency, what contributes to latency, what contributes to the um, to a uh, matching uh, link offset? Well, the underlying network technology, of course. Uh, it's immediately to see that on a fast ethernet, uh, packets are transported slower than on a gigabit ethernet. So gigabit ethernet can transport packets 10 times faster than a fast ethernet. Uh, the network topology plays a role. The number of hops a particular packet has to pass between sender and receiver, in some cases also distance because we have light of speed, uh, may contribute to latency. The network jitter uh, is highly depending on the dynamic traffic situation, on switch performance, number of hops, what concurrent bandwidth utilization is currently on the network, how are the QoS uh, settings in the network. So packets will receive um, a, a various um, delays when traveling through the network and they are not constant from packet to packet. And of course the stream packet uh, configuration, the number of samples per packet contributes to the latency. So if I have a one millisecond packet time, I, I have at least one millisecond of latency regarding uh, referencing the first sample in the packet. 
So um, there's uh, a nice uh, Excel calculation sheet for that, which I'm not going to elaborate either here. Uh, just to give you the highlight of that, um, you can see if we have 48 frames per packet, that's our typical one millisecond packet time at 48 kilohertz, then that's a one millisecond packetization. I can't choose a link offset or latency which is below that value because in that case, the packet is not just uh, readily collected. If I try to play it out, it's not even on the network and is not received in time, of course. If I wanna go with shorter latencies, I have to choose shorter packet times. It's the secret behind this uh, calculation and it also gives you an idea how many channels uh, can I uh, store into a particular RTP packet uh, before I'm reaching or breaking the allowed maximum payload size. There's another uh, table uh, which is nice. It's the worst case latency calculations. I wanna uh, open up that uh, uh, for a moment, just to give you an idea. So I bring this to the front here. All right. So. Um, in this example, without going to uh, explain every detail, we have a typical AES67 stream. It's um, eight channels at three bytes per sample. So that's L24 encoding, 48 uh, frames is one millisecond, 48 kilohertz. So that gives me the uh, payload size. It's nicely below the uh, allowed limit. And from some parameters which are um, stored uh, on the top section, I'm not going to explain this, these parameters right now, but these are all network uh, related parameters. I can now nicely calculate what is the worst case latency for this particular stream if there is no other competing traffic when it has to cross one fast or gigabit ethernet switch. You can see gigabit is 10 times faster than fast ethernet and so on. So I have a second hop, a second switch and a third one uh, and you can see how these uh, numbers uh, increase um, over time. So and after six switches, I have just about uh, one millisecond of additional delay, worst case, in the network. That is if I only have that particular stream there. Now let's assume in the first switch, there is uh, an additional number of 15 other competing streams, which have to go into the switch and out of the very same port. And as you can see, that may increase the worst case latency significantly. And uh, if you now add the same thing at the other switches, just to give you a few, few numbers here, uh, understanding uh, where uh, this might uh, play a role, you can see that now um, we have, um, uh, a larger uh, uh, delay here after the third and um, um, a six up and so on. So in other words, the number of competing streams definitely uh, contributes to the worst case latency calculation. But now as a thumb of uh, a rule of thumb, if you only have one stream, the delay you have to calculate for one switch to pass under gigabit ethernet speed, is about one sample. 23 microseconds is about the sample time. So as a rule of thumb, if you pass a switch, there's an additional one sample of delay. Now, given that we have one millisecond of packet time, that one additional sample may not be uh, of any issue at all. The baseline for all this uh, AS67 uh, latency uh, link offset um, uh, figures is that we can reach sub milliseconds latency, but only if we choose lower uh, packetization time. So people were always like, oh, IP technology would not even give me any sort of low latency. But if you set up your stream correctly, if you take care of your network, you can uh, achieve very, very low latency even in an IP uh, based network. All right, so that's the fundamentals for AS67. Um, let's now switch over to 2110. Uh, for those who haven't been on the uh, last webinar, here's a quick uh, run through uh, on 2110. What is 2110? It's a standard that specifies the transport synchronization and description, of course, of separate elementary essence streams, media, audio, and story data over managed IP networks, very important for real time production, playout, and other professional media applications. Again, nothing for the internet and not for distribution to the home, for example. Um, in order to further explain the uh, essence approach, essence-based approach, we have an already existing scheme uh, to transport SDIA signals, which carry video audience array data. It's the bundled approach. Uh, the standard for this is 2022-6. So we have the complete 
uh, data of an SDI raster uh, um, multiplexed or uh, encapsulated into one single stream. So AV and metadata is flowing in one stream to a particular uh, IP address. That's 2022-6. And uh, 2021, uh, 2110 now goes the essence-based approach. It extracts the active video, puts it into an individual stream. It extracts the audio from the ancillary data, puts that into an individual stream, essence stream. And then the remaining SDI metadata goes into yet another individual stream. So we have three streams sitting on the same network. Um, why will we do this? Now, if we look at a particular processing device, like an audio mixing desk or audio processor, in the bundled approach, the, this processor would have to receive the full multiplexed SDI signal, needs to de-embed uh, the uh, audio or extract the audio from the, uh, from the uh, fully encoded stream, do the audio processing and re-embed everything into a fully uh, packed SDI stream. Um, in the 2110 example or environment, an audio processor only interested in the audio part has just to subscribe to the audio stream, can process that audio stream and put back and process the audio stream on a network without having to touch um, the video uh, signal or the ancillary data signals. So that's the uh, basic approach between these two uh, standards. Let's have a quick look uh, how the 2110 uh, standard is being structured. We have several documents. The dash 10 document describes system timing and all the definitions. The dash 20 covers the uncompressed active video payload. So we're talking about linear raw video. Um, dash 21 as a traffic shaping um, uh, definition, uh, because you can uh, imagine that with uncompressed active video, which has very, very high data rates, we need sort of a definition uh, how the sender is allowed to put traffic on the network in order to avoid overloading of subsequent stages or receivers. Dash 22 uh, touches the compressed active video payload definition for constant bitrate uh, compressed video. Then the more uh, interesting parts for, for, from our perspective are the Dash 30, how is PCM digital audio transported? The Dash 31 covers the AS3 transparent transport. We'll come to that uh, in a minute. And the Dash 40, of course, uh, covers the uh, SDI ancillary data. Now, for us, from the audio side of things, Dash 10, Dash 30, and Dash 31 uh, of, are of importance because these three standards together cover the audio transport, the audio transport in 2110. So let's have a look at linear PCM audio first. Well, dash 10, dash 30, dash 10 is the basic system definition, timing, transport layer, and so on. And dash 30 defines the payload, and basically everything is just as defined in AS67. So all the fundamental protocols, the mechanisms, PTP, RTP, STP, the payload definitions are absolutely identical to AS67. Well, closely. SEMTI added some constraints um, with respect to AES67. Those constraints are uh, explained in much more detail in the white paper available on the um, AIMS uh, website. I'll put that URL up uh, later at the end. But for now, we want to have a quick look into those constraints and understand why and how AES67 might be different from 2110-30. So what are the constraints with respect to AS67. So as we know, we have different functional areas. The first one we look at is synchronization and timing. So for PTP, um, we need to support, if we want to be 2110 compliant, a standard which is called 2059-2. Now, in order to understand this, you need to know that PTP, the precision time protocol, is not just defining the way time information is being transported, but also the operating parameters, like how many sync messages, how many uh, delay requests, and so on, um, are uh, being transported. And it defines just one profile for this, the default profile, the PTP default profile. Now, when we defined AES67 as well as 2110, uh, we came to the conclusion that this default profile is not sufficient enough to achieve uh, a quick and precise enough synchronization. So AS67, as well as 2110, set up their own PTP profiles. And 2159 is the profile which applies to 2110. It they basically defines the sync message rates and all the other message rates and a few more things. And now 
compatible with AS67? And the answer is yes, because there is a good overlap between the 2059-2 and the AS67 uh, PTP uh, 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 profile and even the PTP default profile. Now, all this has been covered in another document, in an AAS report document, uh, which is mentioned here, which tells exactly what the overlapping operational parameters among these different profiles are. So, in other words, an AS67 device has a partial overlap with the uh, 2059 and operational parameters can be configured in a way uh, that they are fulfilled on both sides of this profile. Another requirement is that uh, any device, any 2110 device, needs to have a means of forcing a device not to become grandmaster. So they call us the slave only uh, switch. Um, while uh, the uh, grandmaster selection uh, is being um, processed through what we call the best master clock algorithm. And there will be another webinar coming up, uh, which I'm hosting together with uh, Daniel Bolt from Meinberg, which would explain all these things in, in very much detail. Uh, for now, it's uh, that uh, this is an explicit, uh, a, a switch which would explicitly force the device to never become grandmaster in any given system. So that needs to be in place. AS67 doesn't have the requirement, but it can easily be fulfilled. Uh, and then it adds two more uh, reference information. So we are not just going by the grandmaster ID, but also by traceable, which means that the sender is indicating it is synchronized against traceable time, which usually means GPS time. While all of this uh, can be fulfilled with, uh, with the means of AS67, we have one um, requirement which is not immediately covered by AS67 and needs to be implementation specific, and that is the offset, the RTP stream clock offset. Now, 2110 requires that this offset is always zero, Remember, under AS67, following the RFC 3550, we could have random offsets for each individual stream. Now, the 2110 engineers, when defining the standard, said, we are not worried about any crypto attack whatsoever. We want to make things a bit more easy. So we don't follow uh, the RFC 3550 in this respect. We require that the offset is zero. Now, let's have a quick look at the illustration again. You remember this? From a few minutes ago, we have these various clocks. We have the RTP stream clock offset here. And now 2110 requires that this offset is always zero with each individual stream. So the stream clock immediately follows the grandmaster clock without any offset, and that is for each stream. So basically, the stream clock offset, as it's being defined to be zero, does not have to be conveyed through SDP anymore which, by the way, wouldn't make the STP obsolete. So, looking at uh, protocols, um, IGMP version 3 is required for those of you uh, familiar with networking. Uh, multicast transport is uh, based on the so-called uh, Internet Group Management Protocol, where a receiver tells the network what particular multicast stream it wants to receive, or yeah, it wants to receive. And there are several versions out there. 2110 requires version 3 to be used. Uh, AS67 only requires version 2. The good thing is, even within version 3, there's an automatic fallback uh, to version 2. So uh, if there's only one version 2 device on the network, um, the whole network will fall back uh, to version 2 automatically because it's part of the version 3 definition. So in that respect, we don't have any constraint with AS67. Um, further protocols um, uh, required or um, recommended by AS67 are RTCP and SEP. Those protocols are explicitly excluded by 2110. They do not have to be supported by 2110 devices. And then uh, 2110 adds optional redundancy. AS67 is silent on redundancy, but we have uh, optional redundancy uh, based on another SMPTE standard, which is 2022-7. So you can send uh, two or more streams with the same content around on different physical um, network segments in this uh, scheme and mechanism how these packets are then uh, uh, moved together again. And so if packets are missing, you can recover them from the other um, redundancy segment. There's uh, then another um, parameter which comes into um, into game, uh, which is the channel assignment map. Um, the channel assignment map is uh, basically de describing 
if you're sending around a number of channels, let's say uh, eight channels, it could give you a hint, okay, that the first six is a 5.1 setup and then there's a stereo setup. It could also say, okay, we have four mono channels, then a stereo se a setup and two channels of unrelated uh, relationship. So this might be useful or not depending on the production um, application. However, this channel map is also just optional. And then uh, AS, uh, SMT2110 came up with the uh, packet times. Um, so they said, wonderful, we have this one millisecond packet time, one to eight channels, 48 kilohertz, one to, yeah, one to eight channels, 48 kilohertz, one millisecond packet time. That is what they call level A, which is fully AS67 compliant. They were worried about this one millisecond packet time being too large of a latency. So what they did, uh, they added level B, which says, okay, level B is one to eight channels, but at a packet time of 125 microseconds, which is six frames per channel. And to go even further, to be able to store more channels into the packet, they defined a level C, which can then hold up to 64 channels at the 125 microsecond packet time. Now, only level A is mandatory. That is supported by all AS67 devices. Level B is one of the uh, recommended ingredients of AS67. Level C is a new addition. But then there also there are production situations uh, in 2110 uh, where 96 kilohertz, uh, where they want to run 96 kilohertz. They just added the X behind the level. So they added three more levels um, to support 96 kilohertz uh, operation. Also, those are just optional requirements or recommendations. So to sum up, we have uh, AS67 mandatory uh, requirements. We have the 2110-30 level A. And besides the constraints, 2110-30 level A is fully covered by the larger AS67. And through the optional uh, recommendations within AS67, we also have the level B fully covered besides the constraints I mentioned earlier. So uh, looking at the uh, compatibility between 67 and dash 30, to make it a quick one, we have AS67, we have 2110 dash 30. The constraints are lying outside of the definitions of AS67. Um, does that uh, harm stream compatibility? Well, not really. Every dash 30 stream is fully receptable or receivable by um, AS67 receiver. However, an AS67 sender needs to obey the constraints set forth by Dash 30. And the most important constraint is that it can generate streams with the media clock offset or the stream clock offset of zero. I can tell you that now, uh, these days, I'm not aware of any AS67 device which cannot set the random offset upon creation of a stream to zero anymore. So it has been, and early testing has been an issue, but it's not the case anymore. A quick look at the uh, remaining Dash 31 standard, which is there to transport um, uh, AS3 data. So for those uh, not aware of what AS3, AS3 basically is, again, linear 24-bit PCM, but it carries four additional uh, information bits, the PCUV bits, which are set forth in the AS3 standard. And with this uh, format, you can basically transport any not PCM audio, you know, like Dolby E and others, basically everything which is defined in another uh, SMPT standard. How do we realize that? Um, well, uh, SMPT looked at the Ravenna AMA24 payload definition, which was already able to transport AS3 in a bit transparent manner, which basically retains all the AS67 definitions. It just adds one further byte to the payload. So we have the L24 right here, and the additional PCUV bits and the block and frame start bit um, uh, added to the payload area. So we have to signal that this is a different payload. It's not L24 anymore, as you can see here, it's AMA24, but then again, 48 kilohertz and the number of channels in a particular stream and all the other STP parameters remain the same. So uh, SMPT fully adopted the Ravenna AS3 payload format for the Dash 31 standard. So how does that compare to AS67? Well, AS67 cannot transport uh, AS3. However, Ravenna can, and it's fully covering the Dash 31 requirements. In terms of stream compatibility, also AS67 is out of the game. Ravenna is in, and any uh, Ravenna device supporting the AMA24 profile can send Dash 31 streams, and any Dash 31 stream from a SMPT device can be received by a Ravenna device. 
that's the short story. Uh, final look at a typical application in this scenario. Um, this is a demonstration we set up uh, together with our partner Dolby. Um, as you can see here, we have one stream from the audio playout engine, which is a Dash 30 stream or an AS67 stream, which contains eight channels of audio. Actually, there were even more than just one stream because we had uh, 12 channels, or something like that, of audio. We have a rendering device which receives all the data channel at the audio channels. And then the metadata can be authored in real time, for example, or at a playback stage, which says, okay, uh, um, object on channel three needs to move uh, to the back. Um, you know, some real-time uh, metadata which accompanies uh, the, the stream. So they are set, uh, uh, transported into a Dash 31 stream because that's what it can be used for. And then the renderer can combine the metadata in the stream with the object audio data and can render um, the uh, output according to his individual setup. It might just be a soundbar or a 5.1 or a 7.1 or 22.2 or whatever setup and can combine the audio object data, which is L24, and the audio metadata, which is sent as dash 31 into whatever needs to be rendered on the receiving side. So that's just a, a, a quick example of how to, how what dash 30 and dash 31 combination could do. Uh, resources um, a slide here. Um, you will find a lot of um, papers on configuration of devices and switches where also the QS and the uh, IGMP and all this kind of stuff is uh, mentioned. So you should find something on the resources section of the Revenue web page. Other resources I mentioned is the AMS Alliance organization. There's also a resources section and SEMTI has a uh, FAQ section on 2110. These are also very valuable resources. Okay, that's great. Um, Andres, thank you very much indeed. All right, so I guess we made it, right? Yeah, and uh, thank you for so many questions. Um, yeah, we had uh, over 20 questions, uh, a sure. couple were answered in tech, so uh, thank you very much. For if everything. there's any more questions, just shoot me an email, ravenna at alcnetworks.de, and I'm trying to answer them uh, at that time. Thank you very much for those uh, who are still online, uh, about 100 people still online. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you uh, at one of the next webinars, which happen every Tuesday from now on. Thank you for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.